Wankdorf. Everybody, welcome back to the Tackling Basketball Podcast. My name is Evan. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Mike. We finally make our return after a two-week hiatus. Life has been busy, been sick. Stuff going on, you know? It happens. We have lives outside of this, though that might come as a shock to some. But here we are. Yeah, with how much time we dedicate to excellence in our podcasting. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and how I, many likes and views we I, get because of it. I have never once allowed a single typo to go out on these slides. Never. Never. And I put my heart and soul into trivia every time I write it. <laughs> oh, gosh. With that, though, we'll jump into it with toast and roast. And uh, I'm going to kick things off this week. And uh, I don't have toast. I'm doing two roasts because, uh, I don't know, I'm just feeling spiteful this week, I guess. First roast, though, we're going to start out by roasting anyone who's been hating on Caitlin Clark. Essentially, why? For <laughs> she sucked. <laughs> For this one, what I had in mind is there's essentially two groups of people that have been hating on Caitlin Clark, at least that people have actually seen. One is what everybody know of. It's the male population group that just kind of hates women's sports and hates the fact that there's a female athlete who is tremendous and getting attention. Um, to those people, go back to living alone in your mother's basement. No one cares about you, including your mother. So <laughs> we'll move on to the next group, which is more what I want to roast, well, which sorry. is... The WNBA players who have been, for whatever reason, like, talking crap about Caitlin Clark. And I really don't understand it. One, sorry, you can't talk crap about her basketball ability. She is phenomenal. It is insane. If there was a LeBron-esque talent going into the WNBA, it's Caitlin Clark. Yeah. She's nuts. But for the WNBA players, who I won't name because whatever, um... But to be coming after her, it just looks stupid, too. Like, you have a couple of legends who, during the broadcast and then post-game and everything, were talking crap about her. It's, like, in my mind, it's if LeBron was talking crap about Wemby before the draft last year. It just looks dumb, and if LeBron was doing that, you'd think, oh, this guy's scared of this player, or he's jealous, or something. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want a legend of the game to be doing that. So for it to be done in the NBA just looks stupid. Especially when you're wanting the game to grow. I don't understand the mindset of trying to come after somebody who is going to help the game that you love and you're a part of grow even more. Right. So, each of these people just needs to sit down, shut the hell up, because I guarantee you, Caitlin Clark is coming. And she is going to make the league a lot of money, and whatever team she's going to be on is going to win a lot of basketball games. The fever. So get whatever used to it. Whatever team. Yeah. You never know. They might pass. People can mess up. <laughs> Don't want to make assumptions. But Fair. get over yourselves, people. Caitlin's amazing, and she's the next generation of talent in the WNBA. For sure. Yeah. And going into that and moving on, I'm toasting the future of women's basketball because not only entering the WNBA is Caitlin Clark along with Angel Reese, Cameron Brink, like really incredible players. You also have the highest viewed NCAA tournament uh, in forever for women's mm -hmm. and this finals game against uh, South Carolina and Iowa got more viewership than the last four men's <laughs> final tournament we're recording this the day of men's tournament so don't have the numbers for that yet <laughs> but like not only do you have all of that but you still have ridiculous talent staying in college as well to keep that afloat you still have Paige Beckers you still have Juju Watkins uh Audie Crooks for <clears throat> Iowa State looked ridiculous mm -hmm. in her one game in the tournament dropping or two games in the tournament dropping like 40 in her first game like there's still so much talent in college and an immense amount of new talent going to the WNBA like both of them are going to stay or like WNBA is going to grow college should stay like probably drop a little bit because you're losing Caitlin Clark but still way more than it ever has been like this is a great mainly because Paige Beckers is staying, is what makes it so good for both 
like sides. <laughs> like yeah. you're keeping so much absurd talent in both of those categories that it's going to be so much fun to watch both of those leagues. Yep, yeah, it's a really exciting time. I am uh, looking to propose a new thing for our current uh, Dynasty Basketball League, which is a twin league for the WNBA mm-hmm. with a shared pool, basically. If you win both in the same year, then you, that pool pays out. Otherwise, it accrues. I mean, I've wanted to do a WNBA league for a while, so I'd, I'd be 100%. so down. <laughs> yeah, so it, the, the sport is growing, and... I, I'll be honest, I have not always been very interested in it, and I'm very interested in it right now. So it's a, a great sign going forward for them, and yeah. I'm excited. But for my toast, to round out the all-women's basketball <laughs> toast segment... Um, and roast. S- s- uh, pseudo anti-roast. <laughs> my <fault>. uh, <laughs> it was a, It's a disguised toast to Caitlin Clark, is what you did, I think. But... Um, I am toasting Don Staley, who is cementing herself as an all-time coaching legend, um, not just for women's NCAA, but it all together. She has now won, uh, and her uh, South Carolina Gamecocks have now won two of the last three, three of the last ten, actually less than ten, around seven, I think, they were heavily favored during the COVID year, which got canceled. So very well could have been four of the last seven uh, championships went to them. They've also made three consecutive Final Four appearances. And in the last three seasons combined, they've lost a total of three games. <laughs> they got revenge against the team that eliminated them last season and have now become the 10th team all time to go undefeated and win a championship joining Texas, Yukon, Tennessee, Yukon, Yukon, <laughs> Baylor, Yukon, <laughs> Yukon, and Yukon. <laughs> There's another legendary to the, team here. To, <laughs> to the surprise of absolutely no one. <laughs> so yeah, she's just absolutely cementing her legacy and is showing that she can continue to be a threat for years to come. So <laughs> Yeah, I like it. <laughs> Also, how cool is it that we get to talk about women's basketball this highly? Like, it just right. feels good. <laughs> yeah. It's so a- nice to have another basketball league that we could be excited about. <laughs> I've been waiting so long. <laughs> they mean, don't you like the big three? All right, that was, <laughs> that was my positive. I still don't know what that is. <laughs> that was my positivity. Now time to talk about this jackass. All right. Um, I'm going to be roasting uh, Oakland A's owner John Fisher. Um <laughs> Just look so, at so, <laughs> so much that can go into this, so much that like I just don't have time to dive into. I could probably sit here and just give this guy the business for a couple of hours, but um, obviously he's mishandled the A's. They are atrocious. Lowest payroll in the MLB, which is completely unjustified because people have seen the amount, the money, uh, amount of money the A's make on a yearly basis. He could 100% afford to spend more on the team payroll, but whatever. This comes down to the situation with them moving out of Oakland. Two things. So last week, um, a employee of the Oakland Coliseum sent out a picture of like the sheet of instructions that they had essentially been given by the team of like, this is how you should interact with fans. This is what we need to do in the team store. For one, they were to take down and put away all gear, which mentioned the city of Oakland. Hmm. No more gear is to be sold that says Oakland except for jerseys because jersey sales are so lucrative. But in that instance, they are meant to try and direct fans away from the gear that says Oakland on it and have them purchase other gear instead. Do they they already have Vegas gear? No. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) They are also supposed to remove any signs in the stadium that that are alluding to like the move to Las Vegas because they are seen as negative. So they're supposed to take all the signs away. So essentially like silencing the voice of fans in Oakland and making it so like fans struggle to buy Oakland gear, which is just BS. Yeah. That's horrible. And like, I am not going to sit here and try and defend Oakland as a sports city. There's a reason that the Raiders and the Warriors left. Oakland is just not, you can't have a professional sports team in Oakland anymore. It's not financially viable. I understand the move. But at least with the Raiders and the Warriors, they didn't, like, 
slap the fans in the face on the way out. Like the Warriors and the Raiders both did like a, hey, thank you, Oakland. Thanks for being our home for all these years. Like we love you. We appreciate you. All that. This guy is like, screw (laughs) y'all. We're out of here. Because not only are they moving to Vegas, likely in 2028, but they're not even finishing out their tenure in Oakland. Because next season, they will be (laughs) starting their tenure at a minor league baseball stadium in Sacramento, California, which has 10,000 seats. Yeah. Like, way less than half of the smallest MLB stadium seating capacity. And, I mean, just, again, a slap in the face to all the fans in Oakland. Uh, We're not even willing to stay here and finish out our tenure with you guys. And I know the Oakland Coliseum is crap but i mean it's just ridiculous so and especially if they're going to sacramento there's going to be no justification for them to spend more money so the a's are essentially going to be crap for the next five years which is just sad and depressing that there's an mlb team that you can essentially just bank that will be horrible for that long a time so unfortunately the mlb ownership group won't act to remove him because they will, like, if I were them, I would wait to see as to how effective the A's are once they're in Vegas with all that money-making opportunity because ticket sales there will get split between all the teams in the league. So they're not going to want to get rid of this guy until he's in Vegas. But if he doesn't succeed in Vegas, maybe they'll finally say, all right, Fisher, get the fuck out of here. (laughs) (laughs) So unfortunately, the A's are stuck with this bald piece of crap looking mf who unfortunately owns a professional baseball team. <laughs> I was really hoping you would just stop at bald and trail <laughs> off. <laughs> bald. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> no, I was just trying to figure out, I was like, what can I call this guy without swearing horribly? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, screw John Fisher. Horrible, horrible owner. I think af- now that Schneider's gone from the commanders, I think easily the worst owner in American professional sports, in my opinion. Yeah, probably. Maybe. Yeah. So. All right, Michael, what are you? <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to be roasting the NBA Eastern Conference. Uh, mostly this is a roast against the Bucks, but I've already roasted them twice. And I think the only time we've ever roasted the same team three times is Evan with the Bears. Justified. <laughs> and I don't hate the Bucks. I really like the Bucks. I want the Bucks to be good. Uh, but. Currently, they are on a four-game losing streak going into the playoffs. And those four losses are against the Knicks, who don't have Julius Randle. Still a decent team. Uh, The Raptors, who suck. The Grizzlies, who suck. And the Wizards, who suck. These are some of the three worst teams in the league. And yeah, uh, Dame has missed a few of those games. But Giannis has been completely healthy, been playing fine. This is awful. And just to keep going with the Eastern Conference being bad, Cleveland is on a three-game losing streak against Clippers, Lakers, Suns. Those are way more justifiable. But still, this is a good team that was at the top of, like, like top three of the East pretty much the whole season, have dropped down to five below Magic and the Knicks. And we're going to be talking more about standing mm-hmm. later, so I won't get super into it. But... If you compare the East and the West, uh, Boston Celtics, the game differential between Boston and the number two team, which is the Bucks, is 15 games. <laughs> the third game, <laughs> the third team is Orlando Magic. They're 16 games behind. You know who else? You know who's 16 games behind the first team in the West? The Houston Rockets, who are the 11 seed. <laughs> There is like a 10 team gap in game differential between the two leagues. It is absurd how mediocre and bad yeah. the Eastern Conference is. I'm just hearing that the Celtics are really, really good. They are. <laughs> they are. Like, at the beginning of the season, I mean, I, I think I picked Bucks because I really wanted them, but like, Celtics were the better team, like, should be this. But when you look at these other teams that we had hopes for, Knicks made a lot of really like bold moves, which I really liked. Kind of just got screwed over with Julius Randle getting hurt. Um, Cavs have not been playing well despite being healthy for a, a long period at this back end. Bucks just can't figure out how to play anymore for some reason. We're, 
we have the potential, like the risk, of the very first playoff round being against Boston and Philly, who will have Embiid. That could potentially be huh. the best series happening in the first round, and everything else is garbage. That'd be cool. No, it wouldn't. <laughs> that would be bad. <laughs> Uh, also, the play is going to be so boring for the A's, too. Because, like, you look at the 9 seed is currently six games behind the 8 seed. Which, if we were back in the bubble uh, when the play-in tournament was first conceived, that means there wouldn't be a play-in tournament. They had, a like, yeah. a closeness margin that needed to occur for the game to happen. Yeah. And that's just because it's either not going to be much of a game or... They'll catch fire, and it won't be a deserved playoff berth. Right. So, yeah, if Chicago or Atlanta makes it to the playoffs, we might see that rule come back. It, that would just be a tragedy. Yeah. Tragedy. Like no one wants to see that. If you're knocking out potentially Miami, Philly, Pacers, Cavs, Knicks, and Orlando are all technically in this last week yep. eligible to fall into the play-in. Also, if you look at, um, just to pile on the East a little bit more, two, only two of the top three teams have a winning record in their last 10 games. In the Western Conference, one out of the top 11 teams has a losing record in their last 10 games. <laughs> 10 out of the 11 teams in the West are at least 500 in their last 10. Jeez. I know there's the Jazz. <laughs> the <jazz. laughs> yeah, quietly on a 12 game losing streak. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're bad. Roasted. <laughs> Tough part for them too, we've talked about it. I don't see I don't think there's any path for the Eastern Conference to turn this around anytime soon either. Like outside of the magic, I don't consider any of those teams to be like young and upcoming maybe the Cavs uh, Cavs and the Magic I think the Knicks once they get Randall back they were looking really good but, I mean but there. Randall's already like 28 29 Brunson's 25 I don't think it's a long window mm, but yeah. I think no. they can get better than what they but, are now but then you look at the West and you have the Timberwolves the Thunder the Rockets the Kings the Pelicans the Mavericks to a certain extent like a lot of young teams the who Blazers? are fighting. We, we need to figure out who the hell we're building our team around first. Yeah. Man. I mean, I think part of that is the problem of how many strong teams there are in the West. Because a okay team in the West gets pushed down so far in the win-loss record just be, by having to play more good teams. Right. And so an okay team in the West gets a roughly equal pick as a really bad team in the East. And so it just perpetuates it. Yeah. I think it's also just the fact... You just look at the list of cities over in the West. Like you just think about cities that you wouldn't want to play in. I feel like there are fewer in the Western Conference than the Eastern Conference. Like realistically, who wants to be in Detroit? I'm not sure people are like clamoring to be in Charlotte. <laughs> Washington DC is kind of gone to crap a little bit. Who likes Canada? Yeah, who wants to move to Canada and deal <laughs> with that? Down to live in Canada. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> that sounds nice. <laughs> but I mean, in the West, I think Sacramento, I guess. <laughs> like, I don't think it's my favorite California, probably. <laughs> but I, I mean, it's, Portland. Yeah, so I don't. I mean, people are excited to play in Seattle when they come back. I don't think Portland's a huge detractor. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah. So, for the final roast, I'm bringing it back to women's basketball. Uh, <laughs> three months ago, uh, Lynette Woodard was uh, probably deserving of our toasts when her accomplishments were made very public to the rest of the world. Uh, for those of you who don't know, basically, she, uh, 47 years ago, was on the Kansas Jayhawks and set a... what could have been a very, very long-standing record for career points. Um, the only problem is that the Jayhawks were not on, in the NCAA at the time. So the record was never officially recognized, and she sort of was robbed of it for 47 years until Caitlin Clark eventually passed the one that they do recognize, as well as her own. But the day that... Uh, Caitlin Clark did take over that record. 
the Iowa Hawkeyes invited Lynette Woodard to the game to speak out, to honor her, to say, this woman has been in the shadows and we really want to like just praise her for her accomplishments in basketball. Um, and a few months later, right before the game, uh, uh, the big uh, the big game, since I don't think we're allowed to say... I don't know. It's not yeah. the Super Bowl. Uh, <laughs> that one. <laughs> uh, footage leaked also, of her. I'm not sure anybody's going to copyright strike us on this show. <laughs> <laughs> but footage leaked of her uh, sort of talking at a, a private event about uh, Caitlin Clark. And it was not a very good look. She basically said, um, here's the exact quote, actually. I am the hidden figure, but no longer now. My record was hidden from everyone for 43 years. All of that true. All of that respectable. And then she says, I don't think my record has been broken because you cannot duplicate what you are not duplicating. So unless you come out with a men's basketball and a, a two point shot, meaning there's no three point line, you know, just addressing the elephant in the room. Um, <laughs> I'm like, she just, it's, to, she's not wrong that it's a different game today. But I think that what largely the record books represent is sort of an evolution of the game and an evolution of people who changed the game. And it sucks so much that that was taken away from her. But it's so wrong that she's trying to take it away from someone else now. Yeah. Like, I'm all for acknowledging differences in games. Like, I hate debates about LeBron or Jordan. It's like, you yeah. can't, like, no one will ever know the answer. Right. Different times, different teams. It's all different. But especially, like, you finally, like, got your limelight, which you deserved. Which was given to you by Iowa and Caitlin Clark. Yeah. And they're <laughs> like, also, screw that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's... Yeah, that's not a great look. Yeah, that's a pretty... <laughs> it's a pretty <laughs> dumb comment. I mean, it's... Especially, to, it just looks petty, too, when you're still the second leading scorer in women's basketball history for the NCAA. Like, yeah. Yeah. the other argument, I mean... Sure, Caitlin Clark has a three-point line now, but offense has also evolved a ton since that time, too. Right. I mean, it'd be like if Kareem Abdul-Jabbar came out and bitched about the fact that LeBron passed him. It's like, people just score more now. Like, yeah. well, like I, yeah. don't, I don't know what you want. <laughs> like, and Kareem's <laughs> record is still incredible. Yeah, and like, still will stand forever. Yeah. <laughs> But it's been beaten now. Yeah. The game is evolving, and so do the records. Yeah, so it's, <laughs> it happens. Yeah, that's, yikes. <laughs> Let's now hop over to NBA season awards going through. So we started out at the beginning of the season predicting all of our awards, MVP, Rookie of the Year, Sixth Man, all that stuff. We're a week out from the end of the season. Um, probably, though, still, what, a couple months away from the awards actually being announced? Month and a half, couple months, because it's usually, like, right before the NBA Finals, essentially, I think, is when it usually comes out. Round two. Use, okay. Yeah. But Probably through round two. supposedly, everything that voters will take into consideration is done after this week. Unless something really yeah, happens. Yeah. <laughs> BS, playoffs will be taken into consideration. But, <laughs> but we'll start out here with MVPs. Uh, let's see. Before the season started, Micah picked Giannis. Jonathan picked Nikola Jokic. And I picked Luka Doncic. Michael, we'll start with you. Who are you picking now? Yeah, because I'm the only one who changed my vote. Uh, because you, you cannot give it to Giannis. In uh, continuing to roast the Bucks, mostly just Giannis at this point. Uh, Bucks games where Damian Lillard plays and Giannis does not, they are 3-3. Three and three. In games that Damian doesn't play and Giannis does play, they are 1-7. Obviously, Giannis is better than Dame. Not trying to make that comparison at all. 
But if you want to be the MVP, you can't have a better, like, on-off than yeah. your teammate. Like, that is egregious. And just how poorly they've been playing recently. Just can't do it. Especially with these other players. Jokic, Luka, Shy. The numbers they're putting up. Absolutely absurd. Whatever. With all that said, uh, I do got to give it to Jokic. I think... Like, the only person I would have been like, ah, maybe this person would have been if Embiid stayed healthy and did what he did at the beginning of the season, which would have been ridiculous because what he did at the start of the season was unholy. (laughs) Um, Luka does have, like, I like Luka's stat line more, but when you take into consideration, like, besides the Celtics, I think the Nuggets are the best team in the league. And even with the Celtics, I think it's pretty close. And if you take Jokic out of that lineup, I'm not scared at all. Which is also like my biggest takeaway from Jason Tatum. So if you take yeah. Tatum out of that lineup, who is the best player on the best team, I'm still terrified of the Celtics. Yeah. And that is a detriment to his case. But the Nuggets would not be remotely who they are without Jokic. And he's averaging nearly a triple double with like 26 points. It's absurd what he's doing. So I got to give it to him, but I would love to hear your Luca K7. Lucas, let's be real. I, I picked Luca to be different. I mean, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, I also think Luca has a very, very good case. Like you said, his stat line this season is unreal. He's been playing out of his mind. I mean, he has stepped it up a notch from his first few seasons which is crazy because he was already playing (laughs) absolutely nuts um the thing i think i give to luka over Jokic would be i think luka has done more with less like you were saying you take luka away from the mavericks i'm not sure the mavericks are even in the plan right now Uh, even with Kyrie's renaissance yeah you take Jokic out of the the nuggets yes they're not scary but i think they would still make the plan or maybe like they still have a lot of talent on that team outside of Jokic. Yeah. The Mavericks have Luka, kinda Kyrie, and nothing else. Luka has been insane. He yeah. is carrying the Mavericks on their his back. I mean, what? All of us picked them to be in the plan. I think I'm not sure which one I of us. I think I picked them to just Yeah, miss. you missed them to miss <laughs> you picked them to miss the playoffs. They are currently what, fifth in the West? They are fifth in the West. And it's because of Luka Doncic. There's no one else on that team that you can point to as being the reason. So that's the main thing I give to Luka. And I feel like when I think of most valuable player, it's who, if you took them away from that team, would that team just completely crumble? And that's the Dallas Mavericks in my mind. Again, Jokic is very similar in that regard. Mm -hmm. And I think he will win it and well-deserved. But... Devil's advocate, I think Luka is 100% right there. And if it weren't for the fact that Jokic is also having a nutty season, Doncic, in my mind, is clear winner. Yeah. It's one of those things where it's like, if if he was doing this like four or five years ago, it wouldn't be a contest. Also, if if the the Mavericks were just a bit better, right? Too. It is just just tough that they're they're fifth, they're six games back right now on the Nuggets and the Timberwolves. If you know if Luca was doing this for the Thunder, Luca might have a shot at winning it this year, like legitimately. But yeah, because it's it's just always hard to give MVP to a team that's not necessarily at the top because it's usually best player on the best team sort of mindset. Yeah. Real quick, sorry. Uh, your point about taking away a player and like that being your measure of how bad the team would be. Man, how many wins do you think the Spurs would have without Wemby? They only have Two. 19 with him. <laughs> Two or three. <laughs> he should be MVP. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> the um, Talking Basketball recently put out a bit of a smear campaign. Talking Basketball, not us. They are the way better podcast uh, whose search Debate. bar typos. <laughs> their search bar typos are responsible for 90% of our viewership. <laughs> Um, but he recently put out sort of a smear campaign against Luka Doncic, saying that he's almost redundant with Kyrie Irving. If you look at like their on-off numbers, um, Kyrie really fills a very similar role and picks up the slack when he's off the floor. 
but I kind of disagree. I think that they are only redundant until they aren't, if you know what I mean. Like, if either of them wasn't with the team, you would feel their absence because they pick up the slack for each other when the other's not on the court. Yeah. Like, I don't think that that's a huge knock against Doncic, and I do think he's been having a fantastic year. I think, um, I saw a tweet recently that really sums up Jokic's amazing season and his case for MVP, and that was Nikola Jokic is the only player in the history of the NBA it's as simple as that. Yeah, that's not factual <laughs> at all. <laughs> all right. But Next okay. topic. Point proven, I guess. <laughs> all right. I thought that was a joke, but seriously. All right. Rookie of the year. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Micah picked Wemby preseason. Uh, I picked Scoot Henderson. Jonathan out of absolute <laughs> left field with Bilal Koulibaly. Um, I, I don't think hey, he'll he be my a chance. It's he's going to be my most improved next year. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Uh, I'm not really sure we need to spend much time on this subject. I think we can just all agree it's Wemby. Yeah, I'm not sure there's ever been a better rookie year. Yeah. Cool. All I mean, right. <laughs> Chet's awesome. Got to give a shout out to Chet, but it's Wemby. Yeah. Oh, there's still all. there's still part of me that harkens back to that Ben Simmons debate. Just because you got hurt, I'm not sure that means that you should still be deemed a rookie. <laughs> I totally agree. But, but he's still great. Yeah, he's yeah. no Chet's great. This but. is the first season he's played, and he's done fantastic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but unfortunately, might be. But, all right, now to Defensive Player of the Year. Um, let's see, preseason. Micah had picked Giannis again. Uh, Jonathan had picked Walker Kessler, and I had picked Evan Mobley. Um, current odds right now, you have Gobert as the favorite, Wemby behind him, and Jarrett Allen, because of course Jarrett Allen, he's always in there. Um, I guess I'll start first since I have the different person. I'm picking the favorite, Rudy Gobert. Um, I think he's been the des- best defensive player on one of the best teams in the NBA. The Timberwolves have as good of a defense as they do in large part because of Rudy Gobert. Um, I think he's kind of turned back the clock a little bit to his prime days in Utah of just being a defensive force um i think it's been nice for him now being paired with cat and anthony edwards to no longer have to try and also focus on offense which he did a little bit with the jazz and donovan mitchell where they were like we need someone else to make (laughs) shots but uh if you've seen seen gobert's shooting form (laughs) it's not pretty when he tries to score so now he can just kind of focus on defense be that true five and I think he's been phenomenal this year. Um, I know Wemby has had a lot of amazing defensive games. He's put up huge numbers. I just think on a night-to-night basis, Rudy Gobert is has been very consistent of putting up great numbers, and the entire season has just been a defensive force. Yeah, I think uh, Gobert's not a bad pick. I th- he's also very heavily favored right now, yeah. which is my main problem with this, is how heavily favored he is. Yeah. He's minus 3,000 to Wimby's plus 1,000. Um, and at a minimum, it should be closer. I think a lot of people are giving Gobert the edge uh, for two reasons. One, the Timberwolves' defense is better than the Spurs' defense. It is the best defense. Yeah. And two, um, because the Timberwolves have a fighting chance this year, And the Spurs are fighting for the first overall pick. Um, But, all that said, like, you look at the actual statistics, and Wimby, uh, I'll start, Gobert has .6 steals, 2.1 blocks per game. Wimby doubles his steals with 1.3 and has more than a full block more at 3.6. You look at individual defensive rating, which is a measurement of how your entire team does. It's a little bit of a misnomer, but it's a measurement of how your team does when you are on the court. Gobert is number one in the league at 104. Wimby's number two at 106.3. But to the point of the Timberwolves' defense is better, it's better without Gobert than the Spurs is without Wimby. The... uh, the Timberwolves have the best in the league defensive rating at 108.4, which is only a uh, 4.4 uh, points per 100 possession drop from Gobert, whereas Wimby is on the ninth worst defense, 116.2, a full 10 points per 100 possessions worse when he is 
uh, worse overall than when he's on the court. That's not even the on-off, which I didn't actually do the math for, because that's hard. (laughs) Yeah, the numbers I saw were, like, the difference between Gobert on and off the court is three points per hundred possessions, and Webby's is six points in swing. Yeah, which is... I'm surprised it's only six. It looks like it should be more than that. Um... But either way, I also think the the big like non statistical argument for me is I think that Wimby affects offensive players' mentality more than Gobert does. Mm-hmm. Like you get a lot of people, uh, especially at the top end talent, still trying to back Gobert down, still trying to challenge him at the rim. Whereas Wimby has just shocked people with his length early in the season. No one adjusted, and he was like racking up blocks. And then they started not shooting at all when he was within, like, eight feet of him. Yeah. Because he's just that intimidating of a presence, that quick to close on shots, and has that much verticality to make it happen. So, if you look at who has actually changed the offense of, like, the, their opposing offense more, I think it's Wemby. Yeah, I fully agree. I also picked Wemby for... All of the <laughs> reasons that Jonathan very, very well put together, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. All right, now on the coach of the year, the uh, the one topic boys that uh, we all picked Mark Dagnall at the beginning of the season, and uh, more than likely Mark Dagnall's going to take it. The Thunder have looked absolutely amazing. The guy deserves it. I feel like my second pick would probably be, oh, what's his name? Um, the Orlando Magic's head coach. Uh, yeah, Jamal Mosley. Um, purely just because I think in both situations, teams that no one expected to be in the positions that they are, and that can largely be attributed to how the coach has performed, mm-hmm. the strategy that he's put together, how he's helped players develop. And Mark has been, I think, probably the best at doing it. So, Yeah, I, <laughs> I agree. I mean, we all picked Mark, but... Uh, Again, like I wanted to shout out Chet, I do want to shout out Chris Finch, uh, who's the head coach of the Timberwolves, who I think are tied with yeah tied with Denver for best uh, record in the West, and has put together an incredible team around a combination that no one really thought would work that mm-hmm. well with Cat and Gobert together. Yeah. Like making that work is very impressive. Yeah. Like. Obviously, having Anthony Edwards is <laughs> an incredible boost to your team. Oh, yeah. Um, but, I mean, like, while no one, I think, thought that Gobert and Cat could work together that well and be the number one team in the West, OKC's one game behind, and they are so young. Yeah. yeah. Like, it is absurd. <laughs> so scary. <laughs> That they are this good. They have so many this draft quick. picks. <laughs> and that's because they have an incredible coach, partly. So, yeah, I think Mark deserves it. So they're going to be good for so long. It's so terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> North best division. Top three spots in the West right now. Sir. Yeah. All right. Over to sixth man. Again, we all picked the same guy at the, uh, at the beginning of the season. Um... Mike and I, well, I picked Derek White. Micah picked ugly ass Derek White. His official name. And uh, Jonathan picked Chris Paul. Um, <laughs> Derek White, to be fair, has been great this season for yeah. Boston. Has yeah. been fantastic. If he, he just actually, hasn't been the sixth man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if he actually came off the bench, I would stick with him. Yeah. <laughs> Instead, all of us are picking Malik Monk, who has had a phenomenal season for Sacramento. Has been looking outstanding. Um, I think he just got hurt recently, though. Yeah, unfortunately which is a for them, huge yeah, huge loss for the Kings. sucks for the Kings. But yeah, way to go, Malik. Yeah, <laughs> six man's always kind of a boring award yeah. anyway. <laughs> it's like who's the best player is not good enough yeah. to start. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and the most improved player uh, again. Most improved player. We talked about this at the beginning of the season. It's such a weird award to pick because I feel like year to year, the definition of who fits into this category changes. Some years it's like, oh, a guy who was like already good became even better gets into it. And then some years it's someone you've never heard of before in your life is suddenly good and now we picked him. Preseason, uh, Jonathan had picked Evan Mobley, honestly, had a solid year. Paolo Bancaro, who has stepped it up, but 
let's be real, no one really thinks of it as a star who's becoming a better star. And uh, Micah picked Ben Simmons. Uh, we'll Did I? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> next year. Next year's his year. <laughs> uh, but I'll instead, <laughs> we are now all picking Tyrese Maxey because, duh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, current odds, Maxi at minus 1,600, Kobe White at plus 700, and Jalen Williams at plus 10,000. Um, again, Kobe White and Jalen Williams, definitely deserving, but yeah, Tyrese Maxi has been <laughs> ridiculous. <so. laughs> Jalen Ramsey is like the definition of the guy who's like, you'd never heard of until this year. And you're like, oh my god, <laughs> what is this guy doing? Think about it. Even like Kobe White, realistically, people had only heard of Kobe White kind of just for who he is as a meme. <laughs> it was never really because like, oh, Kobe White was fantastic in college. No, he was just kind of a goofy guy that people had heard of before. But now he's like the one bright spot the Chicago Bulls have as a franchise. Sad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because like, they're pretty old. Yeah, and <laughs> Levine not, is likely not, not going to get a good pick this year. Yeah, if they can trade Levine, his contract is so yes, ridiculous. His contract but. is horrible. All right, well, let's jump over to the NBA playoff picture. Um, first things first, let's talk about. I mean, we've already alluded this to this a little bit. We'll be able to just take it in one direction. Then we've already talked about like the pleasant surprises of this season. The Magic, the Thunder, um, the Rockets to a certain extent. Who have been the disappointments of this season? Who are the Phoenix. teams? <laughs> there we go. Take them there. I mean, like, we were giving, I mean, at least I was giving them tons of credit at the beginning of the season. Like, ah, they're battling injuries. They just haven't, like, been together. They've been healthy enough. Like, I mean, they're on a good run now. I guess they're on one seven of their last ten, but they can pull together really good games, but they're not consistent at all. And I don't have very much faith in them to put together an entire series against some of these teams in the West, especially the Nuggets. But at the same time, like it's hard for me to count out any team that has Kevin Durant in a series. Um, but, like, I thought they were going to be, like, fighting for the best in the West. And to be at heavy risk of being in the play-in tournament is a massive disappointment yeah. for a team that has Beal, Booker, and Durant. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I mean, I... And not tack like I told you so. But, <laughs> like, I feel like the Suns just kind of hit the problem that I thought they would hit. I just... I don't feel like Booker and Beal have really gelled the way that a lot of people were hoping they would because they are meant to play the same position. They essentially have the exact same role. Booker's just like a better version of Bradley Beal, more or less. Neither of them really play any defense. So, I don't know. It's just it's one of those things like if you just glance at the roster and that list of names, you're like, oh, they could be really good. But then, yeah, when you dive into it and you watch their games this season, it's like, oh, that's kind of a mess. And I'm not sure the general manager and the head coach for the Suns thought beyond, like, oh, how cool it would be to have Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, and Bradley Beal on the same team. Yeah. I'm not sure there was a ton of thought put into how are these guys actually going to play together. Because, again, going back to the fact that I don't really understand the thought behind – Bradley Beal is an upgrade over Chris Paul in this scenario. I feel like if you put Chris Paul in this scenario with his passing ability and what he provides, him with Booker and KD, I feel like make more sense than Beal. But yeah, but if he can stay healthy, if he can stay healthy, <laughs> just but then again, I mean, Beal has been great. The Suns had a better record last year. Yeah, with Chris Paul. I mean, so. even without <laughs> Kevin Durant, just yeah. Booker and Chris Paul made it to the finals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think what's been weirdest about the uh, the Suns to me is that like everyone sort of expected their bench to be a huge problem, but we also expected their starters to kick ass. Yeah, and they haven't been doing poorly. They haven't got a lot of time together, but they are only the tenth best uh, five man lineup in the league for uh like net rating which is 
a little bit surprising, a little disappointing. Um, and wait, is that even correct? I mean, they're also right now. They're literally the only reason that they're in the playoffs at the moment is because what they have tiebreaker over the Pelicans. Yeah. Yep. So like the Suns, we could see the Suns slip into the play. Oh, yeah. this week, which is crazy. <laughs> I think everyone has four, three or four games left. Yeah. And there is, I mean, it's a tie between six and seven. Between yeah. five and ten is the Suns, three games. The Suns and the Pelicans will have four left. Let's see, who do they play? The Suns play, oof, Clippers, Clippers, Kings, Timberwolves. Oof. And the Pelicans play... Blazers, Kings, Warriors, Lakers. If I had to put money on one of those teams to win more games, I would bet on the Pelicans. Brandon Ingram is out at least the next two games, which is a big hit to them. But well, They're still. playing the Blazers and the Kings in those next two games. Yeah, that's a point. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I don't love my Blazers, but... Uh... Hey, they were close to getting a three-game win streak before they had to play Boston. They have the fourth worst point yeah. differential in the NBA. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I did just find it. So for teams that have, or for five man lineups that have at least 250 minutes together, they are the 10th in that rating. Um, Jeez. Which is just insane. Like they should, by all means, be number one, probably. Maybe behind Boston, maybe behind Denver. But even then, like, this was supposed to be the killer lineup. Yeah. And then they would suffer with their bench minutes right. and their lineup. The, like, the offense was just going to be so potent that it wouldn't matter. But it's but not I mean, the case. But, that, I mean, how many people thought that about the Brooklyn Nets, though? I mean, and, to be fair with the Brooklyn Nets, when they did play together, they were ridiculous. Their numbers were not 10 in the league. They, they, like, they were ridiculous, but when I look at the Brooklyn Nets, I feel like that unit of guys makes a whole lot more sense as a unit than what the Suns have. Yeah. Harden, Kyrie, and Durant make much more sense together to me than Booker, Beal, and Durant. Yeah. So, like, if I had to put those two trios up against each other, just eye test, I would pick the oh. Nets one every single time just by going, like, yeah, point guard, shooting guard, small forward, or power forward yeah. versus – Shooting guard, copy and paste, make a little bit better. Shooting guard, small forward. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, other team I was going to say that's kind of surprised me a little bit is the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Nets. I like Not that I thought the Brooklyn Nets were going to be phenomenal or anything. I just thought that at least in the East, the Nets would be able to at least make the play-in tournament. Yeah. I just... I knew that, I know they lost Kevin Durant, but I thought they had enough young talent on that team between Cam Thomas, um, Spencer Dinwiddie, like Mikkel other Bridges. yeah, Mikel Bridges, like Claxton. just guys on it. Like I thought that they could be better than the Hawks. I thought they'd be better than the Bulls. Um, that's probably about it. But like I thought they would be worse. I had them as the thirteenth in the East. I think I had them pretty high too. You had them. Okay, so you're not ninth. A part of this. It's just a ninth. conversation between me and Mike. <laughs> <laughs> but. I don't know. Like, I just... Again, in the Eastern Conference, if they were in the West, this is probably where I'd put them. But in the Eastern Conference, I thought they could make the plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But here we are. They're at the bottom. Eliminated. From yeah. Already eliminated yeah, at 31 wins. Yeah. Just Great. as many wins as they are games back. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> Second question, though, which we already dove into a little bit between the Suns and the Pelicans, but um, there are already a few teams. The Celtics are locked in as the number one seed in the East. Um, Timberwolves and Nuggets, Nuggets are battling it out, but them and the Thunder have already clinched playoff berth. What big changes do you think could happen here before we make it to playoffs? Could happen or will happen? Um, again, um, the Suns could drop out, which would be crazy. But what else? Do we see the Pacers managing to slip? And then Embiid's back. Do the Sixers take over the Pacers here in, in the last few games of the season? Do someone like the Cavs or the Knicks fall out of the playoffs? I don't suspect anything to surprise me in the East. 
as far as pre-playoffs, um, and even within the playoffs, I think the only, maybe the only thing that could surprise me is the Celtics not making the championship. <laughs> um, in the West, I would... Here's a scenario that is within the realm of possibilities that would still surprise me, which is two out of the three teams, uh, Suns, Lakers, Warriors, miss the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh... It very well could happen. Right now it's guaranteed that one of them would miss the playoffs. Yeah. Yeah, And I think that that would surprise me. I'm still in a little bit of shock that these two teams are as bad as they are in the Lakers and the Warriors. Um, I just, I struggle to identify age cliffs, and I also often forget how bad of a GM uh, LeBron is. (laughs) It's crazy. So, fun fact, two years after they won their championship, the only two players from their championship run that were still rostered were LeBron and Anthony Davis. Yeah, and I mean, when they after won almost every trade, the team was already ancient. <laughs> they, yeah, they had some good talent, some young talent, but Kuzma. <laughs> that was about it. Yeah, um, I think they had Schroeder. <laughs> never leave a Schroeder open. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I mean, I do think the Lakers are going to make it out of that nine ten seed. Their next three games are. Uh, Pelicans, Grizzlies, Warriors and they're only half a game behind the Kings who like we mentioned have lost Malik Monk Mm -hmm. and are playing the Suns, Pelicans and Blazers which will be a win but Suns and Pelicans could easily beat them Uh, Lakers feel pretty good and kind of hot right now uh, eight of their last ten. So, I feel like they'll make it out, which would leave probably Sacramento and Golden State fighting for a second chance in the play-in. Probably. I mean, I could honestly see either team losing that. And then, probably Lakers, Phoenix. And then, one of them would have to play either the Kings or Warriors. I feel like I would bet both the Kings and the Warriors to miss playoffs if I had to make a pick out of all of those teams in contention. Hmm. But like you said, like these are all good teams that can easily throw together an incredible game. Yeah. Like we could see any of these teams missing. But And I, I feel like the fan base for every single one of these teams probably counts themselves in. Yeah. Like there's a lot of reasons to like your chances as any of them. Oh, yeah. But Without a doubt. But <laughs> if I had to pick the two that are going to miss, I'd say Kings Warriors. Yeah. Yeah, I'd probably agree, especially just with the remaining schedule left. The Warriors still have to play the Lakers, the Blazers, the Pelicans, the Jazz. Probably two wins there. Probably losses to the Pelicans and Lakers, I would say. The Suns then, like we said, Clippers, Clippers, Kings, Timberwolves. Honestly, there is a chance they go 0-4 there. Or maybe one and three with a win against the Kings, which would put the Suns down into the play in, which again, wild. Yeah. But yeah, the Warriors just haven't been looking as good. I think they would lose to a Lakers team in the second round of the play in. I think the Suns would come out of the play in easy, which is a shame. I, I want the Kings to be back in the playoffs. I want to, <laughs> I want to light the beam again. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, all right, the last last question I had here for this was uh, currently, what is your favorite NBA championship matchup? The obvious one being Celtics Nuggets, but uh, do either of you guys have a different perspective on the matter? I know Jonathan doesn't. I, can. <laughs> I think it's going to be Sixers Nuggets. <laughs> All right, Micah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, as much as I would love to see pretty much any other team in the West make it to the championship, (laughs) I don't see how anyone can beat Denver. Like, I don't... I would say Minnesota probably has the best chance with Cap coming back soon. 
and they were the only team last year to actually do anything against the Nuggets. I think Thunder are just way too young. Mm -hmm. Maybe the Clippers could, but I don't see it. I don't have faith in playoff Paul George or Kawhi at this point. I think as a Nuggets fan, the teams that scare me the most, probably in order, um, I think Suns might be number one, honestly, because I don't think that the Nuggets have a very strong bench, which means if the Suns do manage to scrape out the starter minutes, then they have a good shot. Um, then it's probably Timberwolves. Uh, they uh, we saw full force Anthony Edwards last year, and that's what made it such a difficult series. And then I think I would put the Thunder there at third. Um, they're just a, a really good team that plays really well together. I think that we will certainly win our starter minutes against them, and that we will certainly lose our bench minutes against them. So it's just a matter of how long can the starters play. Yeah, yeah. I will say. Real quick, when it comes to Eastern Conference play-in tournament, I just really, really hope Philly gets out of the play-in tournament. Yeah. And then it'll be like Miami Pacers. Miami wins the first game. And that way, Boston's first seed, Sixers are six, Miami is seven. And we won't see any of those as a first-round matchup. Because... Honestly, I'm much more scared of the Sixers and the Heat than currently two through six in the East right now. <laughs> yeah. I just don't want to see... Well, I kind of just hate the 76ers as an organization, but I, as a fan, I don't want to see any of six through eight eliminated before playoffs start. Yeah. Or in the first round. But... I don't know how we avoid that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, do you have a matchup you want to see in the finals? The tough part is, I mean, it's. I would love to see the Bucks in the finals, but I just don't see it at this point. I think yeah. it's going to be the Celtics. Um, and in the West, yeah, I'm kind of the same thinking. Like, I just think everybody else is too young. Not that they don't have enough talent. Like, I think the Thunder and the Timberwolves, 100% have the talent to take down a team like the Nuggets. But it's just when you're a young team like that, you just don't have the experience. You don't kind of have the grit and grind quite yet of being able to play a seven-game series and come out on top. So I think it would be a ton of fun to see a team like the Timberwolves or the Thunder in the finals. Mm -hmm. In the East, I don't know. I think the Celtics probably would be the most fun team. Like, I mean, I guess the Magic would be interesting, but there's no way in hell the Magic are making yeah. the NBA Finals. <laughs> so, although I will say the Celtics are a little boring to watch because they just play fundamentally sound, good <laughs> basketball without really any razzle-dazzle besides Jason Tatum. So, <laughs> so your fun is going to come from a Western Conference team, more than likely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like... I just don't see many matchups being really exciting in the East. Like, I, I can see, like, honestly, anything with Miami because they. I want to see Miami Orlando battle for Florida, baby. <laughs> yeah, Knicks Cavs could be a good series. Especially with last year. Yeah. The flame did. out that the Cavs had. That would be a really fun series to watch again. I want. Yeah. I mean, I think Miami. It's just something else in the playoffs, so they're going to be fun against whoever. Especially if they get the seventh seed and play the Bucks in the first round. Hmm. Like, they've eliminated the Bucks way too early <laughs> many times recently. Yeah. <laughs> so that could be another fun one. Actually, yeah, I take it back. There's a lot of fun <laughs> matchups. I think most of the fun matchups, though, are like in the first round. Because yeah, I feel like yeah. I expect the Celtics to cake walk, right. which means that one out of two games in the second round will be interesting yeah. at best, and then the conference finals won't be. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, but that means, though, if the Celtics get down a game, how panicked is everybody going to be in Boston if all of a sudden they're down in a series to teams that they should 100% be steamrolling? That could be yeah. interesting. If someone manages to get a leg up on them, you might you might see some Boston fans who'd be like, what's happening? <laughs> Didn't they lose every single game one last year or something like that? It was not quite that, but it was close. I don't remember that, but maybe. I didn't pay 
ton of attention in the playoffs last year because the Blazers were uh, nowhere near it. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. One. But and then they almost completed an O three comeback against the Heat. Yeah. So I don't think that you fear too much until you get to like a winner go or yeah winner go home scenario. Yeah. At which point, yeah. obviously, no matter what team you're a fan of, you are freaking out. <laughs> but. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're gonna keep rolling with the NBA talk tonight. No NFL because. Not much going on there. Yeah. Uh, uh, Bills lost their uh, person to. Oh, yeah, that one dude. Oh, yeah, yeah. Stefan Dix. Stefan yeah. Dix, that guy. Eh, whatever. Pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, this question I thought about posting a little while ago, but essentially the question is Is the draft lottery screwing the Detroit Pistons, or do you blame their front office management? Yes. And I mean, I know it's a mixture of both, probably, but you just hear some just stats over the past couple of seasons to take into account. So, Piston stats, 2022-2023. 30th in points scored, 28th in points allowed, 29th in point differential. This year, 27th in points scored, 26th in points allowed, 28th in point differential. Yeah, they're getting better. Slightly. <laughs> Barely. The other thing to point out is they, in 2023, 2022, and the 2020, 2020 draft, they dropped, the they dropped spots <laughs> in the lottery. In 2023, they dropped four spots, 2022, two spots, and two spots again in 2020, which is just brutal. In 2021, they actually increased their lot by one to get Cade Cunningham, but eh, whatever. Final one is, since the 2020 season, start of the 2020 season, they have 73 wins. The worst in the NBA, with the Rockets being the next worst, at 97 wins. So by a 24-win margin, the Detroit Pistons are the worst team in the NBA since 2020. Yeah. I feel like those dropping spots, we talked about this a little before the pod, the draft lottery system as it is right now is set up to help prevent tanking because everybody had an issue with the way the Sixers did it and all that sort of stuff. But for a team like Detroit, yeah, the front office sucks too, but they are seriously getting screwed. Like, it yeah. sucks for Detroit what has happened over the past four years. It's terrible. <laughs> and, like, I will say, like, knowing that you can't, like, trust in the draft lottery, um, you need to be better as an organization. But at the same time, you look at these um, organizations who are in smaller markets, who have... Um, successfully built themselves up to greatness and largely the model there is patience you need to stick with your front office personnel and your coach to give yourself any chance at all because they need to be able to build up that chemistry build up that rapport otherwise you're never going to stand a chance and as a consequence uh, being forced to be patient and having zero ability to trust in the lottery is simultaneously ruining that franchise. Um, you look at like the draft lottery is as like the Detroit Pistons. I think inarguably the worst team right now. Oh yeah, probably the bleakest future. <laughs> yep, <laughs> and uh, they have only a fourteen percent chance at the number one overall pick. <laughs> that is less than one out of seven. So, like, a lot of people look at the lottery every year and they're like, whoa, an eight seed rose up into the top four. This thing is so rigged. And then you do, like, some basic math and it's like, odds are the 10 seed should have done it. (laughs) And you look at, like, Detroit's expected pick. It's the fourth overall. Like, they're expected, based on the odds, to drop three positions just because we've gone so far in this direction of we need to discourage tanking that we have discouraged existing <laughs> for these like bad teams. Um, it's, it's purgatory. And the, the really sad part for Detroit is even if they win the lottery this year, it's not that great of a lottery. No. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. It's not much you're winning. No, I think, yeah, I 100% see Detroit being 
the worst team again in the NBA next season, regardless of who they get to draft this year, which just sucks for them. Let's like, simulate the lottery it, a few times. It especially sucks, too, that they, the most spots that they have dropped was last season when they dropped from should have had the number one overall pick to having the fifth in one of the most stacked drafts that we have had in quite a while. Like yeah. with Wemby, Brandon Miller, and Scoot in the top three. Any of those guys who I think Detroit would have been thrilled to have. <laughs> yeah. Like I know they already have Cade. I think they would still have been happy to take Scoot Henderson. Like you Any can you, them, you yeah, can move sure. Cade to the two. That would be fine. <laughs> yeah. But no, they drop to fifth and get shafted. And because Cade, Cade, Cade Cunningham is He's good. Really good. I like Cade. Yeah. I don't think you can build a championship team around him. I think he needs to probably be the second or the third piece. That's a second. Yeah, on a you know playoff or championship caliber team. So not only is Detroit in that spot, but they've been in that spot now for five, six years. The Spurs were in that spot for two years and now have Wemby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like how? Like uh, if I'm the pit, like what do you do? Like again. The GM of the Pistons, I think, should be fired. He probably should have done better. But at the same time, you sit there and you're like, what the hell do you want me to do? Like, what? <laughs> like, I, I do think it's almost ignorant if you're, like, a Pistons fan to just blame everything on the lottery. Like, there are a lot yeah, of other for places sure. you have fallen. For sure. Obviously. <laughs> like, you've gotten shafted by the lottery. and It's really, really hurt you. I also just have a really toxic trait of when franchises are bad for a really long time, just rooting for them to stay bad. I get that. <laughs> like, and then I'll switch on a dime as soon as they become an uplifting story. Like, I love the Kings now. I love the Mariners now. <laughs> like, oh, this is awesome. Uh, but, yeah, I want the Pistons to stay really bad. I want the Knicks to crash again. <laughs> I never want them to win. <laughs> I feel that way about every big market. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the tough thing with the Pistons. They're not in a big market. I it know. Sucks for them. I mean, they have literally everything going against them, and then they're also getting shafted by the lottery yeah. of Adam Silver being like, we're preventing tanking, and the Pistons are like, you think we're tanking? <laughs> we're just, I swear we're trying. Oh, 13 wins was as good as we could do. <laughs> By some estimations, that might have been better than expected. <laughs> and you give us the fourth pick. <laughs> so I feel I feel bad for the Pistons. Um, similar to the Nuggets, though, maybe Detroit just had to sacrifice the Pistons to make the Lions good, whereas the city of Denver sacrificed the Broncos to make the, <laughs> the Nuggets good. So yeah. at least Detroit has the Lions now. Yeah, they got something going for them. The Tigers. <laughs> The Pistons and the Red Wings all suck, but <laughs> they got the Lions. How many good sports teams could you want? <laughs> hey, why don't we? Uh, why don't we make the Lions bad again next year, just for funsies? As a Packers fan, I'd be okay with that. <laughs> Although it was kind of fun to see the city of Detroit actually have something to root for. <laughs> <laughs> Mike is just blank stare of like screw Detroit. <laughs> yeah. Better be careful. Eminem will come after you. <laughs> He's quick in his boots. <laughs> All right, we're going to cap things off with our What's More Likely segment. That's right, we don't have trivia or sports book showdown this week. Oh, well. <laughs> so we'll finish off with what's more likely. I will start us out here. Who's more likely to win a championship in the next five years? The Oklahoma City Thunder or the Orlando Magic? Thought being, yes, I'm sure you're thinking the Thunder are better. The Magic have a much easier path to the final, though. I still think it's Thunder, personally. It'll be a tough road. Um... But it's not something that I doubt they'll be able to accomplish with a few years of experience under their belt. Um, and then, like, Shea has been phenomenal. He, like, has bounced back and forth between the first and second best uh, candidate for MVP this year. Until now, he's suddenly third. Um, 
And then you also have Chet, who's looked amazing in his first year. Um, and the entire roster really coming up. Jalen Williams, Williams was in, playing absurd. Yeah. And they have so much draft compensation to give to only get better. They're literally, like, trading it away just to get rid of it at this yeah. point. They're, like, <laughs> packaging two firsts this year so they can have one first next year because it doesn't make sense to pick five guys this year. <laughs> Yeah, I I agree. I mean, like, I really like Orlando. I love Paolo Bancaro. But, like, Shea is better than Paolo. Chet is better than whoever Orlando's second best player is. <laughs> like, Franz Wagner. Uh, I do really like Franz, though. <laughs> Franz is great. Again, I like Orlando. They're a really fun team. But, like, even though their path is easier, it's still blocked by... Boston mm-hmm. and, and the West. <laughs> yeah. Like, and, if you're asking West, who's yeah. most likely to make the finals between those two teams, it might be the Magic. Yeah. But I, the odds are so stacked against them for at least two rounds most seasons for the next five years that I don't think they win the finals. Yeah. I'd go Thunder. Fair enough. All right. Uh, for my first one, I'm going with. What's more likely, that Caitlin Clark plays for the WNBA or that she plays for the Big Three? For those of you who don't know, if she goes into the draft uh, for the WNBA, she stands to make $72,000 this year. And if she accepts the contract offer with the Big Three, she'll make $5 million over the next five years. Or was it three years? Uh... Either way, it's an insane margin so does she chase the bag or does she boost the WNBA and rely probably largely on ad revenue for (laughs) I I think she's going to the WNBA I think she'll look at it as an opportunity to boost that brand can view herself as someone who can not save WNBA but help push it forward, kind of steward in a new era of WNBA. And in terms of money, being Caitlin Clark, I am sure she will be able to find plenty of brand deals that will be able to to compensate her enough that uh, I don't think she'll have to worry too much about what her WNBA salary is. And she doesn't doesn't really seem like the type to me that's going to be like pinching pennies of like, oh, I can make five million here or four million. Like, I don't think she's that type of person. So I, especially too, with how young she is. I mean, if you think about what she's, cause she's a senior, right? She's 21, 21 or 22. She plays for 15 years. I mean, who knows in 15 years, the WNBA could be in a position where maybe she's not making millions, but she's making a solid yearly salary better than 72,000 for sure. Maybe a couple hundred thousand or half a million or something like that as the best player in the WNBA. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Based on everything she said, it's been her dream for so long to play in the WNBA. And she feels like the type of person who's going to go for making the sport bigger rather than just getting a check. Um, okay, real quick, I was wrong. Um, it's not $5 million over five years, it's uh, $5 million over eight games. Does that change your answer? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's pinching pennies when it's seventeen it's two thousand a year it's not, versus. It's not pinching pennies, but <laughs> I. The other thing I think you have to take into consideration is that when it comes to brand deals and shoe deals, I think when you look at a company like Nike or Adidas or Under Armour, I think they're going to be more willing to give a brand partnership to somebody who's in the WNBA over the big three. Yeah. Because the WNBA is a recognized professional league. Yeah. You have a bigger market there, supposedly. You have better TV deals. Like, the WNBA is a part of ESPN and all that sort of stuff. It's affiliated with the NBA. Like, literally, the but NBA. the Big Three has Ice Cube. It does. The Big Three is Ice Cube. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. I'm going to change my end. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I wonder if the WNBA would just, like, let her do both. If it's only eight games, and, like, the WNBA starts and ends before and after the big three's schedule, 
but they also have larger gaps between games. It's not as intense as the NBA, which is usually every other sometimes back to back. You usually have like three days off. So like, I don't think many people would like it in the WNBA if she did it, especially her team. But at the same time, if she's like, can I just go play eight games with these people? Like, she's got enough power already as yeah. an incoming rookie that they'd be like, yeah, do whatever you want. Yeah, yeah I'm going WNBA. I'm hoping WNBA. Yeah, I, I can't imagine yeah. that she wouldn't. But. All right. Um, let's go with this is not a, what's more likely this is a would you rather you're starting off a franchise like bare bones you have nothing but you have the choice do you want to start your franchise with Anthony Edwards or do I want to go with him uh, yeah Anthony Edwards or Luka Doncic who would you want to Start your franchise with this is going to be your cornerstone. You could always do the thing I did with the Chet Wemby Bancaro debate where you flip it on us after we answer it the first time. If you have another yeah. player, <laughs> feel free to do both. Yeah. Um, God, I think as of right now, with the caveat of my answer might change in a year or two, I think I would take Luca. I think Luca just as a cornerstone. I feel like I could build around Luca more. I think he just has a better all-around game than Anthony Edwards, like just because he can score at the same clip as Anthony Edwards. I think Anthony is 100% more athletic, but Luca is a phenomenal passer, a great rebounder. His defense has been better this year. He's a fantastic scorer. Um, so I, I think I would still take Luca right now. Again, in a year or two, depending on how Anthony progresses, that might change. But right now, Luca. I I mean I'm I don't know if I leave that much room for change. I think it is just Luca. He's only 25 years old and he's currently probably the second best player in the league. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, you look at if you really want to factor in like money, then you get Ant for less money, but I don't think that matters as much to me as just how talented are they? How much have they proven to be able to like uh, develop the players around them and elevate their roster? And uh, I think Ant is a phenomenal player, but Luca still being 25 is just, you got so much room for him to continue to improve or grow your team. All right. My other, my other player that I was considering was, Instead of Luca putting in Shy, would you still take Shy over Ant as well? I think I would. I think I would take Shy also. I think Shy has proven <laughs> that he's a guy you can one hundred percent build around. Like Jonathan said, he is a MVP candidate this year, and he's what twenty five years old. I think twenty five sounds right. Twenty four, twenty five. Yeah. Um, and one hundred percent the best player on the Thunder. And the Thunder have an incredible roster. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think I would take Shy, Which is crazy. It just, just shows you how much young talent there is in this league. Yeah. That <laughs> pretty easily Jonathan and I just went, yeah, Anthony Edwards is third there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think this one is a much harder debate. But I do think I still come out with Shy on top. Yeah. Uh, it's He is 25. You nailed it. And... Again, that's plenty of time to develop the rest of your roster around a guy who is a proven playmaker. Um, so, yeah. Cool. All right, for my next one. So this team has had plenty of rumors about trading people away. Um, they're kind of in the doldrums right now, even though they have kind of some young people on their team. Who's more likely to be traded away this summer? DeJounte Murray or Trey Young? Summer? Yeah. <laughs> um, They've both been in the conversation of, should the Hawks trade him? Will the Hawks trade him? The Hawks have dangled both of them a little bit. <laughs> yes, I created a good one. They're both Googling. <laughs> DeJounte Murray's only 27. Shit. Um, I thought he was younger than that. <laughs> 
And Trey Young's 25. Ugh, um, Trae Young looks like he's 40. <laughs> if you're going to trade one, I take best offer. And I think that probably you get the better offer for Young. I think you do get the better <laughs> offer for Young. I think I would almost rather have DeJounte Murray anyway. Yeah, I agree. I really like Murray. There's been just like weird reports, I feel like, around Trey Young and... It seems like a lot of people don't like him. Yeah. Like, internally, <laughs> just around the whole league. Um, I mean, like, I kind of thought DeJounte Murray was going to be better when he left the Spurs. Like, he's still really, really good. Uh, but I thought he was going to, like, kind of take it up another notch getting out of San Antonio. Yeah. He hasn't really done that, which I'm a little disappointed in. To- to be fair, on San Antonio, he was the guy, the guy and now he's to share that with Trey. So, yeah, there's partially that. I mean, God, just think, what if the Spurs hadn't traded Murray? <laughs> what if you had DeJounte Murray and Wemby yeah. on the same team? Holy crap, man. Like, the, the Spurs would be, I mean, not, they wouldn't be competing to win, but they would be a team you'd be kind of scared could randomly upset you. <laughs> yeah. They'd be... Top tier like uh, league pass watch team. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah, I think I think I would agree. I think I would want to keep Dejounte Murray anyway, just because I think he has a higher potential. Honestly, I think he's just a better all around player. Trey can essentially shoot threes and pass a bit. That's he's what, a good passer. That's what Trey provides. Dejounte does it all essentially. And again, at twenty seven, still young enough, you have some years to build around him and and try and do something with that team. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. All right. Uh, my next one. Who is the most likely in the West to finish as the one seed? I listed the options, Minnesota, OKC, or uh, Nuggets, uh, just because I think they're obviously the most likely, but any answer is valid. All right. Let me look up their remaining schedules. The... Um, I, Minnesota has Suns, Hawks, Nuggets. Also for tiebreakers, I'm pretty sure that no matter what happens the rest of the year, uh, Thunder have the highest tiebreaker of everyone. Minnesota's next, and then Denver's last. Uh, the interesting one is that the Nuggets uh, play mostly easy teams and, and the Timberwolves. So it's like... it kind of feels like it comes down to that game. Yeah. Although the Thunder have a sneaky chance of, like, if either of these teams drops an extra game, the Thunder can sneak back up. I, well, I mean, I'm going to pick the Nuggets. The Thunder's remaining. They have the Kings, the Spurs, the Bucks, and the Mavericks. It'll be which tough. Is tough. So I, I'm going to go with the Nuggets. I think especially with Cat still currently being out for the Timberwolves and not knowing exactly when he's going to come back. Um, They're hoping before playoffs start. Mm-hmm. So. Hopefully before, but like there's a chance they might drop a random game that they supposedly shouldn't lose just because Cat's out. Yeah. Whereas the Nuggets are currently healthy um, and you know are doing just fine, seven and three in the last ten. So I think I see the Nuggets taking it. Um, yeah. Honestly, I think I probably see the Nuggets taking it over the Timberwolves. Timberwolves probably finishing a game back. And then I think I see OKC at third still, especially with their remaining schedule. Yeah. I could see them losing to the Bucks and the Mavericks and maybe even the Kings, just depending on how hard Sabonis and Fox go to try and get themselves out of the plan and into the playoff picture. Yeah. Uh, I think it also just, which is crazy, only being one game back is still so much yeah. right now. And especially when Minnesota and Denver plays each other. Like, one of those is winning that game. Yeah. So you don't have, like, a, a shot right. of passing both of them yeah. like that. They'd have to get really, really lucky with how those games play out. And Nuggets are healthy. Nuggets are rolling. Like, Minnesota, to their credit, has played really, really well without Cat. Um, Nas Rita stepped up a ton. But, I mean, Nuggets, besides the Minnesota game, is an absolute cakewalk. And then it's the very – is it the next game or the very last game of the season that they play each other? 
I think it's second it's to last. It's second next. No, it's, uh, it's second for the Nuggets. It's third to last for the Nuggets. Second to last for the Timberwolves. Oh, yeah, because they also have the Jazz. Then. Okay. Um, yeah, man, I think there's a good shot. Towns isn't back by then. So, yeah, yeah I'd, I'd say Nuggets. Yeah, and I can see the Nuggets. I'm pretty sure I do see the Nuggets cleaning house here in the last four games. Jabs, Timberwolves, Spurs, Grizzlies. They should. Yeah. <laughs> they aren't necessarily fully healthy, though. Each of their big four have lost at least or missed at least one game in the last four. Yeah. Um, so there's a little bit of concern there, and I'm expecting that they will probably rest players during the Jazz, Spurs, Grizzlies. Yeah. I mean... So there's always a chance that those rests come back to bite them, but... It's a... Like... On one hand, while I'm always like, yeah, at the end, like, get healthy, don't risk anything. Like, especially Denver does have the best home court advantage in the yeah, league. Like, they do. If I was Nuggets, I wouldn't... Unless it was, like, a risky move to have someone play. Like, if they're kind of on the edge, like, I would really be fighting for the number one seed. Random question on this question. Does beginning to see where the suns might fall start to have any impact on where you want to land as a seed if you think they might wind up finishing out as the eighth seed do you suddenly go no you can you can have the one buddy go ahead good luck or if they you think they're going to be the seven do you say okay we have to have the one seed because we don't want to play phoenix in the first round do you think that winds up having an impact on the timberwolves and the nuggets mentality i mean i think it definitely could um. Yeah, I mean, like that's it, a real. It would be a tough thing to predict because yeah, like everything's so close. Yeah, but like if you suddenly see the sun start losing, do you go, huh? Maybe we don't want to win too many games. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, if you get to the last game and everything else is locked, and yeah. you have the power to change that, because that that could be interesting. Yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, like like you said, Jonathan, not that the, the Nuggets would try to avoid the Suns, but I don't think the Nuggets want to play the Suns round one. Yeah. Like, that would be yeah. brutal. I've heard multiple people make this pitch, and it's situations like these that make me really like it, is if you're the number one team in the West, you get to pick your opponent out mm-hmm. of five through eight, and, like, second seed gets to... Like, That'd be kind of fun. <laughs> you should choose rather than trying to manipulate the standings at the end. But like, see that would that would choose. But God, talk about like whiteboard material oh, for know. for like your all right. They think we're the worst team of the four. Let's go get these efforts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it would be it'd be a mixture. Do you want to just would you pick the quote unquote best team? And essentially just, like, openly admit when you pick them, like, oh, we're trying to play the best. Like, we want to play the best on our run. Or would you say, they're the worst, we'll take them, and then give them something to hate you for. <laughs> I think you still take the worst, but it does light a fire under them. Yeah, for yeah. sure. All right. Um, my last question. What's more likely in the next three years, Shy Guy or Embiid wins an MVP? I think both is more likely. (laughs) That's not how this works. (laughs) Because on one hand, I think Embiid is right now the better player that can put up wilder, crazy numbers. He's also better at and cares more about marketing himself Mm -hmm. and putting down his opponents. Uh, so I, I don't him. feel that way as much as you do, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. But also, he is injury prone, and it's been a long time since he's been eligible under these new rules to win. Hmm. Yeah, and if Thunder claim the one seed next year, which isn't unlikely, then Shea probably gets it. Yeah. I'd probably pick Shy just because of the whole injury thing with Embiid. I just have zero confidence in him under the current restrictions. We talked about earlier, you know, maybe Adam Silver backs it off a little bit to account for people like Embiid who, you know, wind up, well, not this season, but 
on a season to season basis who miss like three games more than the current requirement. And it's like, well, that kind of sucks. Like when they should have been able to win MVP, but yeah, I also, I also just think that OKC has a better trajectory right now than the 76ers. Like I, outside of Embiid and then I guess Tyrese Maxey, I don't know, like that team just isn't incredibly well put together. It's not like they have a whole lot of draft capital. I think Thunder definitely have a better future. And there's also the fact that Embiid might leave, which would be interesting. And the thing is, if he leaves and joins a super team, as we've seen with MVP voters, they do uh, they don't like people being on super teams when they vote for MVP, as is evident by Durant never winning an MVP while with the Warriors. Hmm. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> 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 we asked for a symbol. We don't talk to it right oh. now. Yeah. <laughs> I, I said was, like, you would know. When it happens, you'd know. <laughs> I thought we were supposed to say like to Williger or something. <laughs> Tungsten. <laughs> Shit. It's only fun to say it twice. <laughs> all right, everybody. That is definitely all the time that we have for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hit that like and subscribe button if you're enjoying the content. Yeah, and uh, follow us on Twitter because uh, we post there occasionally. <laughs> Usually just, we, <laughs> usually just when we have a new episode come out. <laughs> so, uh, Micah, take us home. Uh, the Detroit Pistons are going to set the new record for longest playout drought in any of the major four leagues. All four combined? Yeah. Wow. Like,